Good morning. You may be seated. Our scripture reading today is Mark 13, verses 3 through 13. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us when will these things be, and what will be the signs when these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, worship team. I want to let you know, I don't know if it's been announced yet, I was in the other room, but uh, these flowers and the ones that are out in the foyer are from the service yesterday for Judy Hayes. And so we had a wonderful service, uh, and I'll just say, when you have someone who clearly loved Jesus, uh, it's very easy to celebrate Jesus when you talk about them. And that was the testimony yesterday. So just a great service, beautiful service. These flowers are from then. Uh, Would you join me as we pray for the service this morning, the message? Lord, it is such a blessing to be able to be in this place and to open up your word and to know that it is true, that it speaks to us, that, that it is not just a document, it is the living and abiding word of God that, that has the ability to change us. That Holy Spirit, you use this to soften our edges, to, uh, to smooth out those rough corners in our lives. You use it to convict us of sin, you use it to do a variety of things. You, you use it to give us hope. And so this morning, Lord, I pray that as we talk about times of suffering, help us to be watchful, but help us to be watchful in hope because we know that you're in control. Lord, I pray that what I say this morning would be from your word. I pray, Lord, that, that Jesus, you would be exalted in whatever we do and say this morning. And we just thank you for the gift of being together in this place as your body and to be be able to open up your word that speaks to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Grant Hurst McClellan. That was the name of my grandpa who lived in Northern California. And he was kind of a self-proclaimed mountain hermit. If it tells you anything about him, he actually once owned a, uh, a gold mine. And so he lived up in the hills just uh, west of Lake Tahoe on the California side. And I remember that we, we got to see him every once in a while, but he lived a little bit far away when we were in Southern California. So every once in a while, we'd be able to take that eight-hour drive and go see him. And one of the things that I remember was the, the last 20 miles of the drive to his house. You see, after you made it through Sacramento, you would go northeast through a town called Auburn, and then from Auburn to Forest Hill, where he lived, there was this road that was long, and it was curvy, it was two lanes, and it hugged the cliffs uh, above the American River down below. And, And we would usually drive that road at night. So as a kid, sitting in the back seat, I would look out the window, and I would not really see all the the beauty of the trees and all that kind of stuff around us, but but I could glimpse every now and then just how close the car was to the edge of the road, and just how far down it was to the river below, that if we were to fall, we would tumble to our death. And it freaked me out. Now my dad, he'd, he'd driven those roads a ton of times. So much so that he had actually counted the curves. He knew how many corners. There were exactly 22 of them. 
And so he would drive them, and from my perspective as a kid, sitting in the back seat, who had never driven before, from my perspective, he would drive too fast. So seemingly unfazed by the perilous danger and impending death that we faced with every single curve. But after a while, after a while watching my dad navigate those roads and, and seeing him drive them with one hand on the steering wheel, I began to realize, you know what? My dad was not afraid of that road. He was not afraid of those curves. He knew where the road went. He knew when he needed to slow down. He knew where the dangerous spots were, where he needed to do some more care. And he knew how to stay in control of the vehicle at every point along the way. And when I realized that, it hit me. We were not going to avoid that scary road. And the dangerous curves were going to come along, and we were going to have to face them. But I could rest. And I didn't have to be anxious because no matter what scary curves might come, we were going to get through it and make it to the end because my dad knew what was coming, and my dad was in the driver's seat. Brothers and sisters in Christ, that's the message this morning from Mark chapter 13. Jesus has just told his disciples that their beloved temple is going to be destroyed. And in response to that, his disciples have asked him, when is that going to happen? And what are going to be the signs of the end of the age? And Jesus begins to paint for them in verse 5 a picture for them of scary times and deadly curves and suffering suffering that the disciples of Jesus are going to face as they, they travel that road through the destruction of the temple and toward the return of, of Christ. Scary times, full of dangerous corners and, and deadly cliffs. They were all going to come, and so they were to be watchful and to stay awake, but to not be anxious because Jesus knew what was coming, and he was in the driver's seat. And my hope this morning, as we, we build on what we learned last week, is that you will be warned that times of suffering are coming, and so you need to be watchful, and you must stay awake, but that you'll be encouraged that if you belong to Jesus, you do not need to be anxious. You do not need to be alarmed. Because no matter what comes your way, you have Jesus in the driver's seat of your life. And he is directing, if you've allowed him to do that, he is directing you wherever you need to go and in total control of whatever dangerous roads you might face. So that's where we're going this morning. Now, last week I shared with you, uh, hopefully you have your Bibles open to Mark chapter 13. Last week I shared with you that Mark 13 is one of the most difficult passages in the Bible to interpret. And because of that, there's different perspectives that have to do with all the details of the text. And those differences stem in part from how to fit some important moments of history into the puzzle of this chapter. And so if you think about puzzle, I don't know how many of you like puzzles. I like some puzzles. But, but there's different kinds of puzzles. Some kinds of puzzles have pieces, and they clearly fit into their different places, right? Maybe the puzzles are bigger, bigger they're more obvious to find out where they go. Some puzzles are more complicated, and they have pieces that are like cut, very similar, and you can put them into one spot, and like, am I forcing it in this spot, or is this really where it goes? And you don't exactly know where it goes until the whole puzzle in the picture is clear, right? That, that's true. That's how puzzles work. Well, well, there's some key moments in history that are like those complicated puzzle pieces, so let me give you a brief overview of some of them. And if, if you're not a history buff or, or those kinds of things, just take this as the foundation for getting to the stuff that you want at the end of the, the message, all right? So here's the first piece of history, first thing we have to notice, and that is the prophecy in the book of Daniel of something called the abomination that makes desolate. Daniel chapter 11. So you can turn there if you'd like. Daniel chapter 11. Daniel was a prophet about 600 years before the birth of Jesus, and Daniel prophesied in Daniel 11 that a ruler would come to Jerusalem. And this is what verse 31 says. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and take away the regular burnt offering. 
and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. An abomination is a sin, usually of idolatry, and making something desolate is to destroy it and to devastate it. And so Daniel was prophesying that someone in the future was going to profane the temple and set up something idolatrous in it, and and they would destroy or devastate the temple. Now, now most biblical scholars agree, at least the ones that I read, that that first happened a hundred years or a few hundred years later in 167 B.C. when the Greek ruler Antiochus Epiphanes entered the temple in Jerusalem and began sacrificing pigs uh, on the altar of God. And and pigs were considered unclean. Then we get to to this dedication of the temple. He he goes in and he dedicates the temple to this pagan god, Zeus. And so that was indeed this abomination of uh, desolation in the temple. That sort of desecration happened again in 70 AD. When the Romans destroyed Jerusalem under Roman general Titus, Uh, The Jewish historian Josephus tells us that not only did Titus and his generals go into the Holy of Holies in the temple, which was prohibited for anybody but the high priest to do, but they also made sacrifices to their gods in the temple uh, courts. So we have this other, this, this additional abomination of desolation. And then along with that, before the Romans entered the city in 70 AD, we have this other historical event that happened. According to church historian Eusebius, as the Romans were beginning to surround Jerusalem, Jewish Christians had to flee for their lives, and they fled north to a city called Pella that was in in the mountains, in the hills. And so they're they're escaping into a different place. So so that's some of this, this history. Those events are in the background as we come to the story of the temple. And those events influence how people interpret Mark 13. And so before we get into the main points of the message, I want to try to concisely, as much as I can, uh, concisely share with you two of the ways that people uh, try to fit those historical pieces of the puzzle into understanding this chapter. And so if you think about like Google Maps, we're going to zoom in for like a street view, all right? We're going to see a little bit more details and walk through just a little bit. And then we're going to zoom back out and get a bigger picture. And, And I think we'll find some areas where uh, everybody's going to agree no matter the details. Okay, so that's the plan. So, so here's the first way that people interpret Mark 13. Uh, and we talked about this last week. First way is they see Mark 13 as all of it taking place in the first century, except for verses 24 through 27, which they say are about the second coming of Jesus. One of the proponents of this view is a guy named Andreas Kostenberger, and here's what he says. Everything in Mark 13, 5 through 23, along with the parallels in Matthew and Luke, make good sense as Jesus' description of a time before, during, and immediately after the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70. Now here's the rationale behind that view. Look at, down at verses 5 through 13. As you read through those verses, Jesus is talking directly to his disciples, and he's warning them about things that are going to happen to them. Verse 5, see that no one leads you astray. Verse 7, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Verse 9, but be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake. Verse 11, and when they bring you to trial and deliver you over... Do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Verse 13, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. And so this first interpretation reads all of that and says, look, Jesus is telling his disciples what's going to happen in their lifetimes. And if we go to the book of Acts, especially chapter 5 and on, uh, we see that those kinds of things happen. If we look at the first century church, we see that all those kinds of things happen. They come true. All the persecutions, all the acts of nature, all the wars and rumors of wars, all of those were going on in the first century. And so Jesus is speaking to his disciples about the things that are going to happen in their lifetimes. But, This view also sees verses 14 through 23, so look at 14 through 23, 
This view sees all of those happening in the first century as well, and that becomes a place of significant difference from the other view that I'm going to share with you. Because Jesus says in verse 14, but when the, you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who were in Judea flee to the mountains. Then in verses 15 through 23, Jesus describes a time of tribulation surrounding the abomination of desolation. Look at verse 15. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant, for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation it is not, as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And so we see in this tribulation time, we see a time when a group of elect, so so believers, are apparently having to run for their lives. And Jesus calls that time a time of tribulation in verse 19. Matthew, in his account, Matthew chapter 24, verse 21, he uses the phrase great tribulation. And so this first interpretation looks at history, and it understands the abomination of desolation from Daniel, first happening when Antiochus Epiphanes sacrificed the pig in the temple in 167 B.C., and then being fulfilled a second time in 70 A.D. when Titus desecrated and burned the temple and destroyed the city. And so for them, the great tribulation that follows started in 70 AD when the Jerusalem church had to flee their lives to the city of Pella, and it will continue until Jesus returns on the clouds, verses 24 through 27, which means, according to this view, we are still living in this great tribulation today. And so in verse 30, when it says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until these things take place. This was fulfilled during the lifetimes of the generation of the original disciples. And yet, those events are signs of the kinds of events that will continue to happen until Jesus returns. And therefore, Jesus' warning and commands are still relevant to us. All right, that's a mouthful. That's the first interpretation. That's how some people read it. And it's important to know, I didn't get all the pieces of that interpretation. And there are people who have variances on it, just like any of you. Here's the second. Here's the second way of interpreting it. And I'll use a quote by Walter Wessel to summarize this view. He says, the best solution is to see verses 5 through 23. So that's that whole time about uh, the sufferings and things. As a shift back and forth between an immediate and a remote future. Some of the events even seem to have a dual fulfillment, one in the destruction of the city and the other in the end of time. And so in this second view, which I tend to believe makes the most sense, this view agrees with the first view that many of the these things that Jesus describes in verses 5 through 23 were fulfilled in the lifetime of the disciples. They did happen but that there are too many other things that haven't happened and too many clues in Jesus' words that point to future events to simply confine them to history. That there has to be a future element to this. And so Jesus must be going back and forth, talking about both things that happened in the first century and things that will happen at the end of time. So for example, and I mentioned this last week, Uh, Right in the middle of speaking about things that would happen to his disciples, look at verse 10. Jesus says in verse 10 that the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And I shared with you last week that the parallel, uh, Matthew chapter 24, verse 14 says, and then the end will come. And so even though Jesus is talking about a lot of things that are going to happen in the lives of the original disciples, Jesus seems to also be talking about something that's going to happen in the distant future. Then we get to verse 14, the abomination of desolation. The second view agrees that in 167 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes was the first fulfillment of Daniel's abomination of desolation. Uh, Many are willing to accept that in 70 A.D., Titus was the second fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. 
But this view also notes that when Jesus speaks in verse 14 of the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, that sounds a lot like Paul's words about the second coming in the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Here's what Paul writes. Verse 3, 2 Thessalonians. Let no one deceive you in any way. For that day will not come unless the rebellion comes first and the man of lawlessness, or the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. And so Paul is describing an abomination that makes desolation that is being committed by the man of lawlessness, the end time Antichrist, who is taking a spot that he does not, that doesn't belong to him in the temple and actually proclaiming himself not just to be like God, but to be God. And so in addition to seeing Antiochus Epiphanes and and Titus as those who committed this abomination of desolation, this interpretation also sees the future Antichrist as the one, Jesus says in verse 14, standing where he ought not to be. And that's why in verse 14 it says, let the reader understand. Mark is, is noting to every generation of readers, look, this has not been completely fulfilled yet, so be watchful. Stay awake. So in this view, that would place the tribulation events of verses 15 through 23 perhaps being foreshadowed in the events that happened around 70 AD, but finally fulfilled at the time just before the second coming of Jesus. And within this view, there's two perspectives as to who will go through that great tribulation period, which Jesus describes in verse 19 as a tribulation unlike has ever happened or will ever happen. One view sees Jesus uh, in a rapture catching up his people before the great tribulation period, or or perhaps partway through it, so that the ones who are experiencing this tribulation are those who come to Christ during it. And another view is that Jesus will rapture and catch up his people after the tribulation period. So that the ones who are experiencing the tribulation are any believers who are alive when the tribulation happens. And so this view interprets this generation in verse 30 as the generation who will be alive in the future during the time when all these things take place. That's the second view. All right. Now you may have picked one. Right? You may have in your mind, as you're reading, you're like, well, I think one fits best, or I think two fits best. Well, here's where I want to camp. No matter which one you pick, no matter which one you think reads best, I think we can agree on some major things. I think we can agree on three significant things that tell us why Jesus is saying to be watchful because times of suffering are coming. And the first reason we're to be watchful is because, point number one, times of, are coming of powerful deception and convincing impersonation. Powerful deception. Convincing impersonation, where, where you think that's actually him. Notice in verse 5, Jesus says, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. Then in verse 21, look at verse 21. He warns them that if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, here he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. And if the one standing where he ought not to be in verse 14 is the future Antichrist, he's one of those who will try to deceive and lead people astray because remember, Paul tells us in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 4, he will proclaim himself to be God. An impersonation, trying to deceive. And so Jesus is saying, be watchful because people are going to come to you claiming that they are the Messiah, even claiming to be Jesus, or that they've come from Jesus, or that their teaching is from Jesus, and they'll even come with powerful signs and wonders. 
Things that look miraculous. Signs and wonders that will be so convincing that if it were possible, they could even deceive the ones who are chosen by God, his elect, to be deceived. He says times are coming of powerful deception and convincing impersonation. Apostle John builds on this warning in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18. He says, children, it is the last hour. And as if you have heard that Antichrist is coming, so now many Antichrists have come. Therefore, we know that it is the last hour. Chapter 4, then, he tells us how to identify the spirit of the Antichrist. Verse 3, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was coming and is now in the world already. And so the Antichrist is coming, but the deceptive spirit of the Antichrist is already here. But where do we see that in our world today? Well, let me give you one example. I have, with the exception of having the Book of Mormon, which I have because I like to compare, you know, different things, I have one book by a Mormon author in my library. It's a book called A Different Jesus, The Christ of the Latter-day Saints. It's written by a Mormon theologian and scholar, Dr. Robert L. Millett. It's actually published by Erdman's, which Erdman's is a Christian publisher. It's published by Erdman's. It has forward by, by some Christian uh, seminary professors. But, but the purpose of Dr. Millett's book is to lay out a Mormon picture of Jesus and try to convince Christians like you and me that the Mormon Jesus is the same as the Jesus of the Bible. That's the purpose of the book. It's an evangelistic book for you. Now, it actually ends up doing the opposite. If you know who the Jesus of the Bible is, you'll be able to detect that this book is, is not about the Jesus of the Bible. But this is a dangerous little book. Because it uses biblical words to talk about things. It exalts Jesus. It glorifies Jesus and his cross. But it has a deceptive gospel that is all based on works. It is not the Jesus of the Bible. It is a powerful deception. And there are many kinds of those powerful deceptions in our world today. And there are many kinds of Jesuses that are being, that people are trying to sell to you and to others to deceive them. I'll give you some examples. You have the prosperity gospel Jesus. The prosperity gospel Jesus promises you health and wealth if you can stir enough faith and if you can give the prosperity gospel's Jesus' prophets enough money. It's a powerful deception. It's deceiving millions. You have the buddy Jesus, buddy Jesus who, who promises you eternal life, who, who says we'll have wonderful times together. I just want to hang out with you, but will not call you to repent of your sin. It's a powerful deception. You have the self-realization Jesus. This is one that's promoted by false teachers like Richard Rohr. It's successfully deceiving people by saying, look, Jesus was just the first one to go before us to recognize and realize the universal Christ. And so all you need to do is follow, to, to self-realize, follow this Jesus so that you too can experience Christness. Every one of those is a false Christ. And it's a false Jesus, and it is successfully deceiving people today. And so Jesus says, be watchful, be on guard, don't be led astray. Second reason we're to be watchful is because point number two, times are coming of pain and tribulation. Pain. I didn't just pick that word, that's actually in the text. Pain and and tribulation. You'll notice that in verses 7 and 8, Jesus describes times of, of wars and rumors of wars and nations rising against nations and earthquakes and famines. But he says in verse 7 that those things don't mean that the end is yet. Those aren't signs that the end is near. In verse 8, he says, these are but the beginning of birth pains. Now, if you think about birth pains... 
And and contrary to what our culture has tried to to tell me and tell men, uh, I will never experience firsthand birth pains. But I understand that they start more infrequently and more subtle. But as time passes and the end draws near, they become more frequent and more intense. And my guess is that the women would say, amen. And so Jesus is saying, there are painful times coming, but they are only the beginning of the pains. Those pains will only increase and get harder with time. So we can anticipate that we will see more wars and rumors of wars. More nations rising against nations. More earthquakes and more famines as creation groans in the pains of childbirth waiting for the end to come. But Jesus says it's also going to get really personal. It's going to get really personal to the disciples of Jesus. Look at verse 9. Disciples of Jesus will be arrested and beaten and put on trial. Verse 12, families will be broken up and siblings will betray each other and children will rise against their own parents. Verse 13, followers of Jesus will be hated because they claim Christ. Parallel passage, Matthew 24, verse 9. Matthew uses the word tribulation to describe all of those things and he notes in verse 12 that lawlessness will be increased and love will grow cold. All of that will grow into great tribulation that verse 19 says has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now and never will be. Here's the point. Here's what I want you to process and I want you to receive. Things are going to get worse and harder for disciples of Jesus. It's going to get worse. It's going to get harder the closer we get to the return of Christ. And that's true whether you believe Christians will go through a seven-year great tribulation or you believe it will be rescued just before it happens. Either way, suffering is going to increase and evil is going to get more evil and we should expect that. Listen to Paul's words in 2 Timothy 3, verse 12. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life What does it say? All. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not might be, not could be, will be persecuted. While evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Life's going to get harder, folks. Persecution is going to grow for those who follow Jesus. Our brothers and sisters around the world have already experienced horrific persecution, but eventually it's going to come to us. Paul says all who desire to live a godly life in Christ will be persecuted. And so if you desire to live like Jesus and live following Jesus, that includes you. So again, we are to be watchful and stay awake so that we can endure to the end whenever that actually comes. Well, how do I know if I'm ready for all of that, all of that stuff? How do I know if I'm ready when it comes? Well, well, there's a lot that we could say here, and I could keep you here for a long time talking about it. But, But let me just go to the most foundational, which is this. Your ability to endure the pains and the tribulations that will come will be directly related to which gospel of Jesus Christ that you responded to when you first came to Jesus. Let me repeat that. Your ability to endure the pains and tribulations that will come will be directly related to which gospel of Jesus Christ that you responded to when you first came to to Jesus. If you came to Jesus because you wanted Jesus to be your ticket to health and wealth, or you simply wanted a buddy Jesus who would never call you out of sin and call you out of that danger of sin, but would just actually endorse it, or you wanted a Jesus to simply be your self-realization example so that you could realize your full potential, if that's your Jesus, you will be led astray when pain and tribulation come. You will be. Because those gospels will fail you. 
They're not good news. They're not good news that bring you to the real Jesus of the Bible. The Jesus Christ of the Bible suffered and died. The real Jesus of the Bible did that for you in your place. He died on a cross so that you wouldn't have to be in that spot. He paid for your sin against God to absorb the wrath of God that you deserve. And then he was raised from death to life. So that if you put your trust and your hope in him, you have eternal life with him in heaven to look forward to and suffering in this life because Jesus suffered. That is the only true gospel. And so only that gospel has the power to change your life. Only that gospel has the power to keep you from falling when the world around you is turned upside down in pains and tribulations. So which gospel, which gospel did you respond to when you came to Jesus? If it's the good news that I just explained, then I I can both warn you to be watchful, but I also get to encourage you. To be watchful. Because point number three this morning as we close. Times are coming when God is still in control. God is still in control. Throughout the entire chapter of Mark 13, Jesus outlines what's going to happen in the future with, with such certainty that he could only say what he says if he was in control of it. And there are some specific words and phrases that Jesus uses that clearly point to a God who is orchestrating all of these events according to a purposeful plan in which he is totally in control. Let me give you some examples. Look at verse 7. Speaking about wars and rumors of wars, Jesus says to his people that when those things happen, do not be alarmed. Why? Because this must happen take place, but the end is not yet. Why must it take place? Well, here's the answer. It must take place because it's in the plan, right? It's according to the plan of God that he controls, which means you don't have to be alarmed because God is in the driver's seat. Verse 11, when Jesus says that his disciples will be put on trial for their faith, Jesus says, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say. Why not? That's scary, right? Standing before a trial, you have all these people that are listening. He says, don't be anxious beforehand. Why? Because the Holy Spirit, he says, is in control of the conversation, and he will be with you to give the words that you need to say. The Holy Spirit of God is in the driver's seat of what you're going to say. Verse 20, speaking of the days of tribulation, Jesus says that for the sake of the elect, the Lord shortened the days. Well, how, how does Jesus, or how does God, how does he have the ability to determine the length of the tribulation? Well, the answer is because God is in the driver's seat. He is in control. Verse 30, Jesus says, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. How, how can he say that with confidence? The answer is, Why? God is in the driver's seat. God is in control of the when and the how and all of these things, how they take place. And because God is in the driver's seat, we do not have to be fearful. We do not have to be anxious about anything that will come. Because God is in control. And instead, we can anchor our hope and our faith to Romans chapter 8, verses 35 through 39. And I hope you have this bookmarked in your Bible app or you have it scribbled on in your Bibles to say, read this. That's what it says. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure, I'm not guessing, 
I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation that covers a lot will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Isn't that great? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Not even tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. Why? Because even in those times, God is still in control and God is holding his people in his loving hands. And so brothers and sisters in Christ, we are to be watchful because times of powerful deception and convincing impersonation are coming and are here. We are to be watchful because times of pains and tribulations are coming and are here. But we can be encouraged. We can be encouraged because regardless of how that deceptive and convincing it might be, regardless of how painful those tribulations might be, we can be watchful with confidence and hope and without alarm or anxiety because even in those times, our Heavenly Father who loves us, He is still in the driver's seat. He knows where we're going. He knows every single corner and curve because He made the road. And if we will trust him, he will take us with him to the end. Our God is still in control, and he has already won the victory for us. Let's pray. Father God, we are so grateful that you are in charge, that you are in control, and because of that, we do not need to be alarmed. We do not need to be anxious. We simply need to be watchful and to stay awake. We need to lean on you, trust in you, put our hope in you, spend our time with you, learn about you, read your word, listen to you. We need to abide with you. But when we do that, Lord, we know that we do not need to be fearful because you have already won for us what we need. You have already given to us everything we need. You you have promised to be with us in our times of need. Father, we're so thankful for that. And we know, and we want to make sure that we recognize and thank you. We know that's because, Jesus, what you did for us on the cross. We know that the gospel, the good news is that, Jesus, you came to pay our penalty so that in you we might have the hope no matter what comes. So, Jesus, be glorified, be honored, and help us. Help us to be watchful, help us to stay awake, and help us to endure to the end when sufferings come. Pray these things in Jesus' name.